This time on Battle Factory, a sharp looking weapon that's been a cut above since World War II. When you need to get 250 tons in the air, it's the only way to fly. Aiming for an enemy that's two kilometers away. And a mini bomb that fights fire with fire. Battle Factory steps beyond the front lines into top secret factories where combat gear is built for battle. When pounded with 100 tons of force, this sheet of steel will produce a blade that's honed by old world craft and cutting edge technology and make an iconic knife that's as versatile as it is lethal. The K-Bar Fighting and Utility Knife first saw action in 1942, when it was issued to the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II. Originally intended for hand-to-hand -hand combat and basic needs, soldiers soon found that they were using the knife to defuse landmines, dig foxholes as bayonets on rifles, and to open ammunition containers. For 70 years, it's been the favorite combat and utility weapon for service men and women. The knife is made up of a leather-crafted handle and a razor-sharp blade of tempered steel. The first step in making the knife is to take a sheet of steel called chrome vanadium and coat it with oil so it won't rust. Then, the 100-ton press punches out the blade. This kind of metal, used exclusively by K-Bar, is flexible and easy to sharpen. The added chrome makes it tough. The next step is stamping. Both the logo and the signature groove are stamped into the knife. This channel is called a blood groove, designed to make it easier to pull the knife from its target. Once they've been stamped, the blades move through a flat grinder. The blade is tapered towards the tip, creating a double edge which gives the knife its signature look. The handle of the K-Bar knife is made up of leather washers. The washers are stacked tight onto the blade handle with a compressor. Then, all the leather pieces are hammered into place and capped. The cap is then secured with a steel pin, so the new leather handle is kept tightly in place. Next, a sander cuts deep grooves into the leather and smooths and tapers the handle for a better grip. Now, the handle is ready for painting. A brick of wax is loaded into the machine and the leather rotates around it. The wax protects the handle against wear and moisture. Then, the grooves are colored with a black dye, which soaks easily into the leather. And the handle is complete. Each side of the cutting edge is sharpened by hand to exactly a 20 degree angle. Any thicker, and the knife will be dull. Any thinner, and the blade won't last. A skill that takes a master craftsman years to perfect. Finally, the blade is polished against a cotton wheel. This buffs the metal and removes any imperfections left on the blade. Once polished, the master craftsman takes each blade and slices it through a piece of paper. If the knife is too dull, the paper will crumple, but if it slices cleanly, it's ready for testing. First, a laser beam measures the angles of the cutting edge. If it's one degree off the 20 degree sweet spot, it goes back for resharpening. If the angle is accurate, the blade must pass the rope test. If it can't get through a piece of nylon rope in two slices, it doesn't make the cut. Then the knife is checked for imperfections. 
Even the smallest flaw means it's sent back for refinishing or ends up opening boxes on the factory floor. Once the knife has passed inspection, it's boxed up and shipped out for active duty. The K-Bar knife has served alongside generations of fighting men and women. Whether it was close quarter combat or opening a can of rations, the K-Bar was built to give a soldier the edge. Coming up on Battle Factory. This high-tech transport weighs 65 tons and it's lighter than air. And a sniper's bullet that travels three long seconds to connect to its target. When these aluminum struts are joined together, they'll make up the shell of an airship that's never been seen in the sky before. Aeroscraft is the first of its kind, a 21st century take on the Zeppelin airship that has been part of flying tradition since the 1900s. Zeppelins of the day were originally designed as passenger ships and couldn't lift much cargo. And they were powered by highly flammable hydrogen gas. The Aeroscraft might look similar, but this military-funded prototype could revolutionize cargo and personnel transport. Airships of the future will be able to carry up to 250 tons of cargo and be able to take off and land vertically on any terrain with no need for a runway or ground personnel, making them the perfect transport system for bringing aid to ground zero in the aftermath of an earthquake or a hurricane. It took 10 years and $35 million to get the Dragon Dream prototype this far. But before it can go into full production, this experiment has to prove it can get off the ground. The Aeroscraft is made up of the helium buoyancy system, the aeroshell, the control center, and a rigid structure. The rigid structure is the skeleton of the Aeroscraft. It's made of lightweight aluminum and carbon fiber, strong enough to carry heavy loads and light enough for flight. Creating the trusses is like erecting a bridge. There are over 200 of them, ranging in length from 6 to 18 meters, and each truss has to be welded to the next by hand. It's taken 50 people three years to finally put together the form that creates the floor the ceiling, and the cargo compartment. It's designed to be strong enough to support the propulsion system, the cockpit, and the helium containers. Helium gas is what makes the aeroscraft lighter than air. In the past, the original airships would rise with the help of a lifting gas, hydrogen, and by dropping ballast, water. However, hydrogen is highly flammable, and an accidental spark could end in disaster, as it did with the infamous Hindenburg in 1937. Helium, which is not flammable, powers the Aeroscraft's groundbreaking variable buoyancy system. This enables it to move up and down like a submarine without taking on ballast. Simply adding compressed air from the surrounding atmosphere puts the helium under pressure, which reduces lift so the craft drops. Release the air, the helium expands, and the craft rises. So the first step in creating the buoyancy system is to make the large helium container. Made with lightweight plastic, filled with helium, and stored in the upper trusses of the ship's fuselage. It takes over 10,000 aluminum struts to make the outer shell. Wafers of honeycombed aluminum are sandwiched between each of the struts, and holes are punched out to make the aerodynamic frame even lighter. Once the shell is built, the next step is to cover it with a fabric skin made of mylar and carbon fiber. The skin is designed to deflect the heat of the sun away from the helium. 
too much heat expands the gas and makes the ship harder to control. Once the exterior is complete, the glass cockpit, which includes seats and a touchscreen control panel, is suspended from the bottom of the ship. The Aeros craft is steered by a rudder and powered by three engines which rotate on their bases for maximum maneuverability. The engines, wings, and the rudder are installed. After five years and $35 million, all the pieces of the Dragon Dream prototype are installed and ready for testing. Computer simulations can only predict so much. It all comes down to this moment. If this scale model gets off the ground, it will give the company the real world results it needs to take production to the next level. A fleet of lighter than air aircraft that will be able to land anywhere on earth and unload enough military force to protect a city or enough humanitarian aid to feed one. Lift off. While the aerocraft's maiden voyage only goes about 15 meters off the ground, the prototype's test flight was a success. Expectations are high. Now, the real work can begin. Coming up on Battle Factory. How to take down a target two kilometers away. And a plastic egg that's harmless until it hatches fire. In 48 hours, this harmless block of metal will be formed into the most accurate weapon on Earth. The AX-338 sniper rifle. Its predecessor, the AW-338, holds the record for the longest confirmed combat kill in recorded history. In Afghanistan in 2009, it was used to hit a target from 2.4 kilometers away. The AX-338 breaks down into four main parts. The magazine, the barrel, and the chassis and action. The chassis and action are the guts of the gun. Together they hold, feed, and fire the ammunition. The chassis is cut from a solid block of aluminum on a CNC machine a computer-controlled cutting machine that ensures accuracy to the tenth of a millimeter. A coolant spray reduces friction and overheating. What makes this gun so accurate is that the chassis and the action are locked solid. There's never any movement between them, not even when the gun is being transported, and especially when the gun is fired. In long-range operations, even a microscopic shift means missing the target by several meters. Using the same process, the action is cut from a block of steel. The action and chassis are set aside in order to make the hinge. The hinge connects the butt of the gun to the chassis. It's made of two pieces of solid aluminum that join together perfectly. Once the hinge is locked in place, it doesn't budge. But when unlocked, it shortens the length of the rifle by 25 centimeters. In combat, the enemy is always on the lookout for the sniper whose longer rifle can give him away. But the ability to shorten the gun means the sniper now blends in with the other soldiers and avoids becoming a target himself. The mounting tube is an innovation developed to fasten night vision, lasers, and other accessories to the barrel. It starts as an aluminum cylinder. 
It is milled into an eight-sided shape with over 100 key slots drilled into its sides. The attachments hang off the slots. The mounting tube is free-floating, designed to fit over the barrel without touching it. That way, the weight of the attachments won't put the barrel off balance and affect the aim. The precision-designed barrel is 68.58 centimeters long and rifled with unique grooves on the inside wall that cause the bullet to spin and fly straight. When the bullet leaves this barrel, it'll be traveling at more than twice the speed of sound. In the record hit of 2009, the sniper's bullet took three seconds to travel 2.4 kilometers, or 20 city blocks, to connect to its target. For its final exam, the rifle is calibrated for 100 meters. Five shots are fired into the target. Every shot must land within this three and a half centimeter diameter for the rifle to be deemed battle ready. In a war zone, police standoff or hostage taking, the sniper is often the only solution to a bad situation. And if a target is caught in the crosshairs of an AX338, from 20 city blocks away, he'll never know what hit him. Coming up on Battle Factory. Little plastic eggs that can burn a forest to the ground. These colorful plastic eggs may look harmless, but they're actually little time bombs that can set a forest floor ablaze in under a minute. Dragon eggs are mini missiles that are launched from a gas powered cannon. 20 seconds later, the egg ignites to spark a strategic blaze from a safe distance. Firefighters use the combustible eggs to stop wildfires in their tracks by cutting off their fuel supply, fighting fire with fire. The Green Dragon launcher is made up of three parts the chemical injection system, the launcher, and the eggs. The incendiary eggs are made up of two halves of a plastic sphere that's three centimeters in diameter. The egg is fueled with crystals of potassium permanganate, a chemical that on its own is harmless, stable, and non-combustible. Until you inject them with antifreeze or glycol, which in 20 seconds, results in a volatile exothermic reaction that flares at over 2,200 degrees Celsius, causing enough firepower to set even wet wooded areas aflame. About 10,000 of these harmless looking eggs are produced in a single shift. Enough firepower to burn 60,000 hectares. Agencies across North America and Australia will order over two million eggs in a year to control wildfires. The launcher contains 200 parts and takes almost eight hours to assemble. With only 20 seconds between injection and ignition, the launcher's got to work perfectly or the whole system can backfire. The launch mechanism incorporates a four cycle system that moves the egg into the chamber, injects it with glycol, drops it into the barrel, then launches it on a blast of air. In Bosnia in 2012, dragon eggs were fired from the turret of a tank to clear overgrown minefields almost 20 years after the conflict. On the firing range, the glycol reservoir is filled up and up to 450 dragon eggs are dropped into the hopper. The green dragon is armed and ready to deploy.
dragon eggs can be launched from a moving vehicle or dropped from the sky. The eggs are launched 40 times a minute and need to travel up to 60 meters in order to keep people out of the hot zone. The chemical reaction starts in the air, but doesn't fully ignite until the 20-second mark, once the innocent-looking egg hits the ground a safe distance from the cannon and the operators. This little plastic sphere may look like a child's toy, but when armed, it has the power to starve a wildfire or clear an overgrown battlefield. This time on Battle Factory, this lifesaver rolls into the danger zone to neutralize a bomb. A transport vehicle that's battle ready anywhere, even underwater. And if you have to bail out at 30,000 feet, this life raft could mean you'll live to tell the tale. Battle Factory steps beyond the front lines into top secret factories where combat gear is built for battle. When this piece of aluminum is welded and wired, it will become a robotic arm that can punch through walls, look for suspicious objects, and carry deadly explosives safely beyond the blast zone. Employed by military and police security forces, the robot can go where people shouldn't to seek out and extract explosive devices for safe detonation. In the chaos of 2013's Boston Marathon bombings, robots played a critical role in preventing further casualties and in the apprehension of the bombers. The robot, named the WM Knight, is made up of the arm, the hazard probe, and the chassis. The chassis is the guts of the robot and what gets it from A to B. It's made from sheets of lightweight aluminum and each part is cut using a water jet. Water and sand combine under very high pressure to make a precision blade that slices through the metal like butter. Then, the sheet is bent under 88 tons of pressure to form the chassis frame. Once formed and machined, the chassis is sent to a paint booth. The aluminum walls and the air gun are wired with opposite electric charges, which attract, so the thick coat of powdered paint magnetically sticks to the surface. This powder coating is tougher and more durable than a standard paint job. Next, the wheel bases are installed. Then, the gear-driven chain pulleys. Two motors, controlled independently, drive one track forward and the other one backwards to maneuver the robot around corners. The first ever bomb robot was invented in 1972 after eight British soldiers were killed by IRA bombs in less than a year. A lawnmower was jerry-rigged with a remote control to make the first primitive bomb robot. It's since evolved into a critical life-saving member of every bomb squad. Today's night robot comes a long way from the lawnmower. The tires are mounted and encased in a track that will keep them rolling together. This design allows the robot to travel over rough terrain, including deep snow and even up and down stairs. The arm is cut from aluminum using the same water jet process as the chassis. Then it's welded together and painted. The arm of the bomb robot is designed to move like the human arm. Its aluminum shoulder, elbow and wrist move independently. It's strong enough to lift 113 kilograms and its unique hand grip is precise enough to pick up a paper cup without crushing it. The secret to the precision is in its gearboxes. Each one is outfitted with a complex gear system, allowing the joints to move in multiple directions. The arm's cables, made of copper wires, 
are the nerves and tendons that connect it to the operator. The cables are threaded into the arm's aluminum skeleton, and the arm is now operational. Kitted out with lights, camera, and an infrared scope, the arm can extend three meters in the air to access hard to reach spots. And it can be controlled remotely to keep humans out of jeopardy. In the manhunt following the Boston bombings, when the killer was finally found, it was a robot who pulled back the canvas tarp to find him hiding in the bottom of a boat. The Hasprobe, short for Hazard Probe, enables the robot to break through hard surfaces and uses a camera to see what's beyond them. Under the hood of the Hasprobe is an 18-volt motor that powers the drill. It can be outfitted with any number of drill bits, depending on the material it has to get through. Once the hole's been cut, the drill bit pops off, making way for the camera. It can see beyond a wall or even into a suspect vehicle, giving the robotic arm the upper hand. Before the bomb robot can be put into the field, it runs a complete simulation. A gas tank is used in place of a bomb. For this test, the robot has been fitted with a small ramrod designed to break through glass. The arm reaches through the shattered window and lifts the tank out of the car and carries it off for safe disposal. With so many soldiers losing limbs and lives to IEDs, over 3,500 bomb robots have been deployed to Afghanistan. And to date, over 750 of them have been destroyed. But for every robot lost, human lives were saved. Coming up on Battle Factory. If you're lost at sea, this raft can buy you the time you need until help arrives and a bulletproof, waterproof carrier that can track any terrain to bring personnel to the front line. It will take days for these rolls of watertight fabric to be cut and sewn and fused together, and seven seconds to put to work. Seven seconds that may make the difference between survival and never making it out of the water. In October of 2011, a search and rescue team of three was parachuted into Arctic waters to rescue men trapped in the ice. When their plane had to return to base on account of weather, the rescue team became the victims. After five hours in the icy water, two of the three men survived by waiting in their personal life rafts. The single-person life raft is designed to be stowed in the cockpit of fighter planes. If the pilot ejects over open water, the life raft goes with him. The single-person life raft can be broken down into three parts. The hull, the floor, and the canopy. Sheets of bright orange fabric are rolled out. The color has been chosen, so the canopy can easily be seen from the sky. Guided by a computer-generated stencil, the electronic cutting station tracks the program measurements, marks the pattern on the fabric, and cuts it out. At the sewing station, Velcro trim is attached to the edge so it can be closed around the body. Velcro is flexible and can withstand the high-pressure vacuum packing required for the ejection seat a zipper would get crushed. If you're bailing out of a fighter jet, help may be on the way. But if you go down in icy water, death by hypothermia can occur in a matter of hours. This canopy can make the difference between life and death while waiting for help to arrive. The floor is made up of two layers of specialized nylon. The first layer is brushed with glue, and dimple patches are pressed into the pre-marked spots. 
When the floor is inflated with an onboard tube, the dimple patches create a quilted pattern of air pockets, which insulates the survivor from the chilling water. When the raft is assembled, it has to be watertight and maintain its buoyancy. The super glue that does this is made by mixing neoprene and a chemical activator. The glue is mixed daily and every batch is tested. The bond has to withstand at least five pounds of force. If the glue doesn't make the grade, any rafts made with the batch are rejected. Next, high resistance nylon cord will be placed into the floor to assist in inflation. The cord provides a pathway for the gaps between the layers of compressed nylon. Another cord connects the sea anchor known as a drogue, which slows and stabilizes the raft in high seas. While the stranded search team waited for help in their protective canopies, their life raft's anchor also kept them from drifting off course and being lost at sea. The two layers of floor are attached, leaving a tube exposed that will be used for inflation. A rubber inner tube is inflated and attached to the floor of the canopy. While the top of the raft is orange for visibility, the bottom is black, making the life raft less visible to sharks. Next, the rapid inflation system is installed. Each raft is fitted with a carbon dioxide cartridge hooked up to the valve on the side of the hull. It'll be used to inflate the raft once it hits the water. Now, the raft is ready to be tested. When it's folded up tightly, it'll be small enough to be fitted in an ejection seat. And in the event of an emergency bailout, it'll be ready to deploy in seven seconds flat. The single person life raft is ready for duty. And if you're using it, you're probably having the worst day of your life. But now there's a chance you get to see tomorrow. Coming up on Battle Factory, an armored amphibian that will take the troops to the front and back in one piece. When this steel-plated hull is fitted with controls on the inside and tracks on the outside, it'll become a Viking, an off-road warrior that can get troops in and out of any combat zone, even if it has to go through snow, sand, or water to get there. And it can keep its passengers protected, even under fire. In June 2007, a squadron of Vikings filled with British Marine commandos were returning to base in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, when they suddenly found themselves under heavy fire. They had driven into a massive Taliban ambush. The Marine commander retaliated with onboard machine guns and smoke grenades. He was able to lead his squadron to safety with minimal loss of life. He gives credit for their escape to the speed, firepower, and agility of the Viking. The Viking BVS-10 is an armored amphibious troop carrier that breaks down into four major parts. The wheels, the treads, the rear cabin, and the front cabin. The Viking's bulletproof skin is made of ballistic steel and ceramic plates. The armor for the doors, the hood, and the roof is cut to size using a high-pressure water jet cutter a combination of water and sand that knifes through the metal with surgical precision. The Viking's two cabins hold a dozen soldiers, four right up front and eight in the rear, which can also double as an ambulance or weapons bay for carrying mortars or tank missiles. When the Taliban opened fire on the Vikings with rocket-propelled grenades and heavy machine guns, the Vikings' armored exterior protected the men inside. 
Once cut and bent into shape, cabin pieces are assembled in preparation for welding. A robotic welder lifts and spins the five-ton cabin into position. Automated torches fuse the bulletproof walls together at exactly the right temperature. Every weld is programmed for accuracy and speed, and every millimeter counts. If the vehicle isn't welded together exactly right, it won't be able to handle the punishment that the rough terrain delivers, and the seams will crack under pressure. It takes five full hours to weld the cabin body. The body is designed with flat surfaces to avoid radar detection. The radar echo bounces off the surface in just one direction which makes the vehicle appear smaller than it actually is. Once the front and rear cabins are complete, they're sent to be painted with an anti-reflective and infrared dampening paint. Once the hull has been painted, it's kitted out with electronics, air conditioning, and navigation systems. The 285 horsepower diesel engine is powerful enough to drive the one and a half tons of steel at speeds up to 65 kilometers per hour. In the ambush in Afghanistan, the Vikings were outnumbered and outgunned, but they were able to outrun the Taliban and keep them at bay, returning 50,000 rounds of fire from their front-mounted heavy machine guns. And hiding behind a smoke screen of white phosphorus grenades, the Vikings tore over the tough terrain at high speed. The hydraulically controlled articulating joint gives the Viking its ability to move both horizontally and vertically and handle anything the road can throw at it without breaking up. The girder and wheel system is designed to distribute the Viking's weight evenly so it can glide over snow or swampy terrain where other tanks would sink. The girders that are the foundation of the wheel system are ground and then robo-welded to exact specs. The hard rubber suspension is what enables the tank to take a pounding. First, a rubber bearing is fit into the suspension. Then, six small road wheels are attached to their axles and installed on both sides of the girder. With the Taliban on their tails, the Vikings raced through rocky riverbeds and sharp hills without stalling or getting trapped in the mud. But when the deadly chase finally took them to the edge of the Helmand River, the Vikings had only two options, face the fire or swim. Coming up on Battle Factory, the Viking has to resort to its secret weapon. When a squadron of Viking armed troop carriers were ambushed by the Taliban, they found themselves trapped on the shore of the Helmand River. With the enemy on one side and water on the other, the Viking turned to its secret weapon, its ability to swim. It plunged into the deep water. The Viking's unique design allows this one and a half ton vehicle to glide through the water instead of sinking like a stone. By applying rubber sealant to all the doors, windows, and openings, the watertight vehicle floats due to displacement. Its rubber tracks spin under the water dog paddle style to propel the vehicle forward. The Vikings managed to cross the river and transport the men to safety. Despite being outnumbered three to one, its armored shell and go anywhere track system got the troops home with minimal casualties. If you ask the Marines on the ground, they'll tell you without hesitation. If not for the Viking, nobody would have made it home alive. The final step is to attach the rubber tread. The hard molded rubber is tough enough to keep on moving, even if the Viking rolls over an anti-personnel landmine. To install the track, the Viking is lifted off the floor, then the tread is rolled over to the vehicle. 
A tread wheel is attached and the rubber track is stretched tight over the road wheels. Now the vehicle is complete and ready for testing. First, the water test. The Viking runs the test course like a true amphibian, plunging into three meters of water and gliding along at full operational capacity. This test ensures that the cabin is leak-proof and that the Viking can maneuver underwater. Next is the terrain test, ripping through the deep mud and scaling up a 31 degree grade without slipping. True to its name, the Viking is built for battle on land and in the water. No matter what and no matter where the mission, the Viking can get you there and back in one piece.